is there another comedian who had the the tenacity, the entrepreneurial spirit to rent arenas themselves? <laughs> like, has anybody ever done that? And what what was that even like? The first time I rented arena was mid uh, mid to late two thousands, and it was really because. After everything that happened with my brother, I was in a real bind, and I had everybody um, in my. Uh, it's funny. I had accounting and people in my accounting who almost very quickly were like, "Don't need us anymore." I mean, that's how set back I was. It was almost wow. like we don't need to uh, do any accounting with you because you're kind of at you know and square you, one. You told me last night that you had just bought a house, and they were like, "Hey, they were uh, like, you're, you gonna to, you're gonna have to get out of that house." Yeah, <laughs> it was it was two weeks away from like paperwork being signed, and they were like, you, you, "No." How old were you? Oh, uh, I have like dyscalculus, so sometimes numbers. Get, uh, I was 28, 29. Um, and they, <laughs> so they were like, they were like, you know, don't do this. Well, I was like, I am going to keep this house. It was my dream house. And my idea was I had some money he couldn't take that was in like some stocks that just weren't easy to just, you know, power of attorney out. And I took $450,000, which was pretty much mostly all I had to my name. And I was like, how do you rent an arena? <laughs> yes. And I started calling arenas, basically just calling and finding out it's just a, it's just a hall. Right. And mm -hmm. when there's no game in there, it's just like, except for a couple of insurance things that yeah. you got to cover. Back then, maybe it's different now. It's like, it's just a big hall, especially B arenas. It's a big VFW. It, I, well, I found that out. So I rented, uh, I don't remember the first two I rented, but I remember the door is mine, the merch is mine. Uh, we did some deal on the on the um, you know food and drinks, and at the end of the two nights, I'd already put like a million eight or something <laughs> back in my pocket, and I went, all right, here's two hundred thousand. Rent me two more that are within that range, and we just kept renting the B ones or maybe even a, a C one here or there, packing it out, and then I kept renting them. I probably rented honestly like eighty arenas on my own, and just was like by the end of the year when I saw him in court, I'd already made everything back he stole. It, what took me like 17 years, I pretty much banked in a year. Unbelievable. It's so rad. But I think it was Barry Katz told me about you renting arenas. Yeah. And uh, like, is that, is that a model that anybody, <laughs> anybody else adopted? No, but I know that other people, you know, they just well, rented. They're doing it now. Yeah. But back then it was like, I knew I was of that level. And I'm like, fuck, I, I you know, I want to be there. But I also don't want to, I can't split with anybody. I don't want to do any like, you know, I don't want to do any, I need as much as what I can retain to get my company and everything and be like, you know, back with my head above water. And I also just had a personal grievance against my brother that like, just completely honest. I was like, I, when I see him a year from now in court, I want to fucking look at him and say, I have it all back. I just wanted to be able to say, I have it all back. By grievance, you mean resentment. Yeah, I had like, I, uh, yeah, I, I had like a was, fire burning was, inside of me. Was there any gratitude that if he never did that, you wouldn't start renting? Oh, yeah, yes. they, they, Dane told me that last night at dinner. Yeah, I mean. He said, had that not happened, I would not have reinvented yeah. myself. You know why I'm okay with it? Because uh, past the betrayal and everything that breaks inside of you when somebody you love does that, betrays with love. Worth, I mean, betrayal is bad enough. Betrayal with love. But I can actually look back and it's like, I got a lot of love from him. I had years of love with him. There was great memories. There's things that I can still look at and laugh. I used to think he rewrote my past. There was an era where I was like, I couldn't look at a picture without being like, that's not the fucking guy in the picture. And then just through doing the work um, and having great mentors and people around me to help me, it was like, no, I had great years with him. Everything happened the way it was supposed to happen in order for me to really feel um, like I was standing on my own without being shrouded in the negativity that obviously he had around me for a lot of years that I didn't know till it was gone. And once it was gone, it was like, oh, wow, this is what it feels like to have like, you know, clear air around you. So, yeah, it's like and I still have a great relationship with his son. I'm super close with my nephew. I love him. It's like everything that needed to come from that did. 
It's crazy. So, so what, uh, is your brother still in prison now? No. Okay, he served good. like five or six of eight years and then he was released and he's I've never talked now. to him since. <laughs> he's my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> he's your poor, poor guy. Yeah. He learned a little bit on that comedy tour, man. Yeah. The time he was, you jumped right on the right spot. <laughs> um, so, so is there uh, in like the, the justice system for, for that situation, is there like restitution or do they just say, oh yeah, a fuck ton of money. We don't expect you could ever pay it yeah. back. So. It's like there's all these promises and restitution and like the 48 charges or whatever that he was brought up on, mm. um, you know, equals like a dollar a month that you get back at some point somewhere. But I honestly right. looked at that and I was like, whatever the punishment is, give it to him. But uh, I, there's nothing from that that I need anymore. Right. Would you ever see him again and be like, dude, we're cool? I will tell you this because I have to be careful what I talk about at this point. I'm working on a documentary with a great group of people right now, and it's really about that era, the highest of highs of how did I do, what's my philosophy and how did I get there and stand up? And really, what is the cool, fun, funny shit that happened? And then the other side is talking about my brother. It's like the Empire Strikes Back of, of comedy series. And if I do it right, and if I answer your question in some regard, uh, when this is on a streamer, maybe, or if it is, it should be either under a comedy or true crime. Or maybe both. Yeah. That's kind of where I wanted to live. Like, That's dude, great. that was fucking funny, but that was fucked up. That's that, hopefully where I wanted to be. Dude, true crime is my shit. That's mine too. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with JCS on uh, YouTube? No. Oh my God. With no, that, no. that YouTube criminal you always listen to? Crim yeah. It's criminal psychology. I just love all I'll that I'll dial shit. in on that. I watch all of that. I'm oh, still dude. watching like old forensics files from dude, like I'll, fucking I'll text you 88. particular bangers. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Episode nine. Yeah. Do you, do you <laughs> feel like... Uh, do you, do you feel like you had a lot of, like, when you had that hate inside of you, you had a lot of, like, it, energy blocking you from, like, going forward in life, and then finally once you got over that, like, your life started taking off again? Like, do you feel like there was some energy that held you back, and once you're able yeah. to... Yeah, oh, for sure. I was in the undertow moment for, you know, a few years. Because like of I that said, hate? He, uh, it wasn't hate. It was, like, humiliation. Resentment. It was humiliation was the number one thing, because... Oh, this is tough to not get. We grew up in a household that because of my dad's alcoholism, there was a lot of humiliation attached to his behaviors. And so that was the key word. Like, we got to look like we're cool because, you know, my mom and I were like, oh, we don't want to, we don't want people to be able to like take our power with this, even though we already knew the neighborhood knew. And I think there was just a whole thing of like, I thought I'd presented myself in my life and career as like, oh, this is a self, what self made looks like. And then he made me look or feel at that time stupid. Like I'd made the worst decision. And I knew some people were using that, like weaponizing that and saying like, oh, you're not as smart as you have claimed to be by getting to where yeah. you did. So yeah, it was more like, it was like humiliation coupled with the inevitable come down of a career at the same moment that that was all kind of like happening. So it was like, oh man, this feels even more like they're pushing me down the hill even though I could look back later and be like, no, I had my run and it was awesome. Yeah. But but you're back and you feel better. Like what happened to get you to like, Oh man, I just, I love stand up. I love making people, I, I'm at my core. I just love making people laugh. I love, I'm a very curious person and I love getting on stage. I'm a storyteller. I love improv. I, I love human behavior. I like conversations that can be real and gritty. And I wanted to be able to take stand-up into more places than I had taken it. When I when I hit, I had like six tools, pretty sharp, but I was like, I'm still lacking in so many things that I wish I was better at. And it took me more years to get like, what does that mean? Like, I wanted to be more introspective. I knew some things that I needed better in my storytelling. I, I wanted to be more uh, transparent about like failure equal to like, uh, um, not just going up there and being like look what I did how cool is that like being able to go up and be like here's the shit sandwich that I ate and wow. and I ate every bite and when you could talk about all those things it's just such a different it permeates the the world in a different way because now your laughter is meaningful but your poignancy is meaningful and then and then from that all I've all I've had the opportunity to share in like thousands of versions of this now where it's like I've grown up with people that are like hey man I'm glad we keep each other in check your comedy keeps me in check your truth keeps me in check it's just a nice place to be and it's a nice place when you meet somebody like him to where um, Gil Gilchrist yeah. <laughs> where somebody knows I don't want anything from you 
I don't need anything from you. I just want to share a little something with you. It's a really great feeling, especially in the industry when you meet somebody you know. That's what Jerry Lewis was for me. When I met Jerry Lewis, he became like a mentor, in many ways like a father figure. He didn't want or need anything from me. And it was just such a valuable correspondence and currency of conversation with him. And that's what I want to be able to be in my comedy and just, you know, in real time yeah. with anybody, with any of my relationships. It's called Steve-O's Hot Sauce for Your Butthole. And if you go on Amazon and type in Steve-O's Hot Sauce for Your Butthole and order yourself a bottle, you'd be really helping me. Because right now we're ranked number 30 on all of Amazon. And if you buy a bottle, we might go up the ladder. And that would mean a lot. So please get on Amazon and buy Steve-O's Hot Sauce for Your Butthole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude.